the Enlightenment was a period in history that transformed Western culture. The Age of Reason, as it became known, occurring in the 17th and 18th century, saw long-established monarchies, religious institutions, social systems and hierarchies challenged from below and a philosophical search for human improvement. Ideas of liberty and religious tolerance traversed Europe, creating social upheaval, revolution and change. But as the Enlightenment spread across Europe, Europe was spreading across the world. And this process was far from peaceful. While developments in industry and politics may have encouraged exploration and discovery, they also witnessed the rise of imperialism and a vast and oppressive institution that would transform the lives of millions of people across the globe. This institution was slavery. In the early modern era, native populations in the New World had paid the ultimate price as a result of European expansion. Due mainly to the introduction of foreign and deadly diseases that they had no immunity to, roughly 80 million Native Americans had died after European contact. This mass mortality was so significant as to cause the Little Ice Age, a period of global cooling as a result of reforestation. Colonists seeking fortune seized land across the New World and set about making it provide profit. African markets were exploited and unprecedented quantities of slave labour was used for cultivation. Between 1500 and 1866, roughly 30 million Africans were enslaved and transported to the New World, where a new, profit-driven, systematic and brutal plantation system based on violence awaited them. And that was if they made it. At least one in ten of those transported did not even survive the notorious Middle Passage. Britain claimed a significant stake in the trade, alongside other European powers, including the Dutch, Portuguese, French and Spanish. More than 3.2 million slaves were transported from Africa on British ships to the New World, primarily disembarking in the British Caribbean colonies of Jamaica, Barbados and St Kitts to name but a few. Roughly 500,000 slaves did not survive the voyage. The transportation of slaves was exercised on a massive scale and was part of a wider, triangular Atlantic commerce. Slavery is absolutely central to the British Empire from the 17th century all the way through the 18th century. And the reason for that is that slavery is at the centre of a system of trade. Slaves are purchased by British merchants on the West African coast and they're transported across the Atlantic on the notorious Middle Passage to plantations in the Americas, primarily in the Caribbean. And there slaves are put to work producing a variety of crops, but principally sugar, that gets transported back to Britain for British consumers. This was a modern commercial system which created long-range markets for both labour and consumer consumption, none of which would have been possible without reason, rationality or the Enlightenment. In fact, many believe the Industrial Revolution, a hallmark of the Enlightened era, actually began in the Caribbean. The slave trade became hugely profitable to Britain, and through capital flows, investment and the establishment of a market for manufactured goods, some had claimed that a stimulus was provided for industrialisation to occur within the metropole. Slavery and sugar created huge individual fortunes, and it also benefited the British consumer. In the 17th century, if you're going to eat sugar, you have to have a lot of money, because it's incredibly rare. Um, but these plantations that are being planted in the New World 
mean that this commodity is being produced in far greater quantities than ever it was before. And so the price goes down. Um, and so British consumers are very hungry for this. They like it. And if you think about our diet now, um, cakes and scones, jam, all of these things depend upon sugar. Even the, the sugar that British people have, would have been using to sweeten their tea in the 18th century. Um, all of those things quite quickly become central to the way that people live their lives. Britain's treasury also gained immense wealth from the trade, and hence the imperial defence was able to receive substantial funding. It could be easily argued that the trade in Africans lay at the foundation of Britain's empire. So it, it actually goes quite, uh, quite a long way beyond just people eating sugar, um, the money from sugar um, uh, transforms society, it creates new wealthy elites, but it also uh, enriches the exchequer and, and provides the, the funding for the expansion of the British state. Yet after roughly two centuries of involvement in a trade that had generated vast amounts of wealth, had developed ports, towns and cities, and had transformed the lifestyles of those within the metropole, Britain decided to abolish its slave trade on the 25th of March, 1807. But why was the abolition bill ratified? In an age where politicians' motivations rarely strayed beyond the nation's security or economic interest, was the Abolition Act really passed in philanthropic spirit, as an act of pure altruism, or for the good of humanity? In this documentary, I will attempt to answer this question. I will be exploring the lead up to abolition, and in particular, the initial humanitarian impulse, led by figures such as William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson. I will also be exploring pro-slavery responses, both within the metropole and across the Atlantic, to the fierce debate in Britain. In my journey to understand why abolition occurred, I will acknowledge the challenges faced by the abolition campaign, and a change in political strategy that along with favourable external factors eventually led to the Abolition Act of 1807. On the 22nd of May 1787, 12 men, 9 Quakers and 3 Anglicans met here in what used to be a printing shop in the city of London. They met to coordinate a campaign which had one sole purpose, ending the human traffic of Africans across the Atlantic. Together they formed a society for effecting the abolition of the slave trade. The movement had emerged universally amongst all of its evangelical and Quaker founders from a religious reaction against what they all derided as nominal Christianity. The gospel, however, had been used for centuries to endorse the commerce. Many slave owners and merchants, including the highly regarded planter Edward Long, had emphasised the compatibility of slavery with the Christian scripture, using passages from the Bible to reinforce the moral foundation of the institution. Members of the Abolition Committee represented a new form of Christianity, however, a generation of Quakers and Evangelicals who viewed the slave trade in a new enlightened era as a commerce which went against all of its religious principles. The movement had also emerged in an era when colonial institutions were already beginning to be questioned by those in Britain after the American Revolution. Many began to debate the identity of the British Empire and what role it should undertake on the global stage. Abolitionists had clearly expressed through their attack on the slave trade their visions for empire, one which abided by and promoted new, enlightened forms of Christianity and became a bastion of reform and positive change. The conflict of the trade with Christianity was best expressed in the widely read and influential essays written by two abolitionists retrospectively, the Scottish Anglican curate James Ramsey and the devout evangelical Christian Thomas Clarkson. 
James Ramsay had worked as a naval surgeon in the West Indies and had lived on the island of St. Kitts from 1762 to 1777. The curate commented on the inhumane treatment he had personally witnessed whilst living in the Caribbean in his essay on the treatment and conversion of African slaves, published in 1784. Ramsay suggested that those involved in the brutal trade, who would be willing to sacrifice their profits in order to ameliorate the conditions of slaves, would be rewarded by God. Endless are the methods by which, in an unperceived manner, he can turn the common accidents of life to reward men who prefer duty to present advantage, who cooperate with his benevolence in promoting the happiness of their fellow creatures. The pains that we use to improve the minds of our fellow creatures will return with advantage into our bosoms. God's grace will be stirred up within us and our own disposition and behaviour will be corrected and amended. Ramsey also commented on the benefits of ending the trade in terms of its promotion of Christianity among slaves, many of whom may convert to the faith, and hence, Christianity would receive new strength, liberty, new subjects. The Anglican campaigner and founding member of the Abolition Society Thomas Clarkson, in his award-winning thesis published in 1786, entitled An Essay on the Slavery and Commerce of the Human Species, echoed the words of his influencer Ramsey. In a more direct attack on the slave trade itself and those slave owners involved, Clarkson claimed how Christianity suffers by the conduct of you receivers, for by prosecuting this impious commerce you keep the Africans in a state of perpetual ferocity and barbarism, and by prosecuting it in such a manner as must represent your religion as a system of robbery and oppression, you not only oppose the propagation of the gospel as far as you are able yourselves, but throw impediments in the way of other who might attempt the glorious task. It's a really important thing to remember that as important as sugar was, and as lucrative as sugar was, there were always people who had their doubts about how it was being produced. So anti-slavery, um, questioning slavery, is something that we see from the 17th century through to the 18th century in some form or another. And very often those qualms that people have about the institution of slavery are moral and religious. Is it right to exploit other human beings in these ways simply so that we can have a commodity that we enjoy eating? Looking back today, it would seem appropriate to view these men as evangelical heroes. After all, they were doing the right and honourable thing by attacking such a brutal and degrading commerce. Yet at the time, these men were seen as little more than mad eccentrics, and at the very best, romantic idealists. And that's because they were attacking an institution that had defined British wealth and power for generations, and an institution that was growing every year. And so this begs the question, how was the Abolition Society going to gather the support of the increasingly literate, but still predominantly illiterate population in Britain? And more importantly, how were they going to get government to listen? The Abolition Committee set about this task by mobilising a campaign that would gather the support of millions across Britain. Morality, humanitarianism and Christianity were central to this campaign, and abolitionists would use innovative strategies and propaganda still seen in effective pressure group politics to this day. Clever, and perhaps at the time, unconventional campaigning tools were used by the committee to mobilise the public. To play upon the moral conscience of the population, pamphlets were published and brandished with images that elicited sympathy from even those who were illiterate. Brooks's slave ship was a prime example of an image used to rile the public. An illustration of the inhumane and cramped conditions endured by Africans aboard a slave vessel that had sailed from Liverpool to Jamaica in the late 18th century. 
The use of branding also enabled the public to express their disapproval of the traffic and feel as though they were engaging in the debate. The campaign's emblem, designed by Josiah Wedgwood in 1787, that depicted a knelt and shackled slave begging and uttering the words, am I not a man and a brother, was worn on bracelets or medallions, stamped onto pottery and kitchenware, and even used on tobacco pipes. To many, it became a symbol of an enlightened view of the world. Really quite suddenly, uh, a group of abolitionists motivated for a variety of reasons, but mainly through an interest in religion and a moral outrage at slavery, managed to galvanize popular opinion so that by the end of the 1780s, um, with the formation of an abolition society looking to end the slave trade in 1787, millions of people had started to sign petitions calling for the abolition of the slave trade. By engaging with the wider public, the campaign was able to gather huge momentum. Dozens of sugar boycotts were organised and petitions received millions of signatures. Despite there already being an appetite for debate in Parliament, the campaign was now bolstered by the support of the masses and the fundamental question of abolition could be ignored by government no longer. It was also not only white abolitionists in Britain who opposed slavery. For generations, enslaved Africans in the Caribbean had been finding ways to resist and rebel against the system. This would continue and take on new forms during the time of the abolition debates. And in Britain, the black community, many of whom were escaped or former slaves, also found ways to raise their voices against slavery. One such man was Olaouda Equiano, one of the most influential abolitionists of his generation. A former slave who had purchased his freedom and travelled to Britain, published his autobiography in 1789, which documented his kidnap from Africa, his voyage across the Atlantic, and the brutality he witnessed during his life in slavery. It was very common for slaves to be branded with the initial letters of their master's name and a load of heavy iron hooks hung around their necks. Indeed, on the most trifling occasions, they were loaded with chains, and often instruments of torture were added. The iron muzzle, thumb screws, and such are so well known as to not need a description, and were sometimes applied for the slightest fault. I have seen a negro beat until his bones were broken, but only letting a pot boil over. By 1792, Equiano's book became a bestseller. Evidence such as this not only gained public attention, but became extremely useful when it came to lobbying for abolition in government. The man to spearhead the campaign in Parliament was William Wilberforce. The MP for Yorkshire, perhaps best known for a speech he delivered to the House of Commons on the 12th of May 1789, was convinced that the trade should be stopped not only in principle, but also due to the inhumane conditions endured by slaves across the Atlantic and throughout the infamous Middle Passage. Using facts and figures accumulated by Clarkson, Wilberforce reasoned that the trade was morally reprehensible and an issue of natural justice, exposing in detail the appalling conditions in which slaves travelled from Africa during the Middle Passage and arguing that abolition would also bring an improvement to the conditions of existing slaves in the West Indies. Never had the issue been so explicitly described in the Commons Chamber. Wilberforce's 12 resolutions signalled the beginning of a long battle to abolish the traffic in Parliament, and his arguments were echoed by MPs throughout the 20-year debate that would follow. The early campaign, however, for all its noise and all its support, saw very little legislative success. Wilberforce's first proposed bill, introduced in April 1791, was defeated convincingly, and eight years later, Britain's slave trade witnessed its biggest year, with nearly 50,000 children, women and men 
forced onto British merchant ships to labour on sugar plantations in the tropical colonies. As the 19th century dawned, Wilberforce and the other abolitionists clearly still had a mountain to climb. One major obstacle that they had to overcome was the overwhelming influence and vested interest of wealthy colonial planters. So the abolitionists are trying to abolish something that is really, really quite important and entrenched. You know, the, the, the slave trade, slavery, and the production of sugar had been central to the British Empire for uh, a while by the time that they begin their campaign. So it's not a surprise that they come up against opposition. And principal opponents for them, perhaps unsurprisingly, are those people who own large numbers of slaves and those people involved in the slave trade. Sugar planters with big properties in the West Indies um, are a really vocal group that seek to oppose the abolitionists and argue against their case for ending the slave trade. But also the traders of slaves, uh, Liverpool merchants and Bristol merchants, um, traders operating ships out of those two really big British ports that are central to the, the slave trade on the West African coast. Those slave trading merchants are also really important voices in opposition to the abolitionists. I see that the miscreant Wilberforce has begun upon the slave business again. If they mean nothing, why do they plague us? But they are so ignorant and obstinate that they do not nor will not hear truth or reason. Reason tells everyone to be humane to everything under him, but they will not allow us to have common sense. Reason tells them not to grate and harass the minds of people that give them a revenue of a million and a half yearly and feed 600,000 of her inhabitants. But Envy says, no, I will annihilate you and I will suck the blood from your vitals. The initial momentum of the abolitionist movement was, in the early 1790s, stopped in its tracks. But this was not a result of any mismanagement or miscalculation by the movement. It was external factors that came into play. Events occurring across the Channel and in the Caribbean. In part two of this documentary, we will focus on these external events namely the revolution in France and consequently the slave uprising in the former French colony of Saint-Domingue. What effect did these events have on the abolition campaign and how were abolitionists able to utilise the domestic political environment in their bid to see the trade abolished forever? <laughs>